Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I always like to come to Dublin. I came many times last year to draft the report to present it to the Parliamentary Committee. Um, and it is a pleasure to be back here. I was asked to talk about Europe's response to the crisis. And indeed, we have seen an exceptional crisis, which is not over. A global crisis, a European crisis, and of course, a crisis in Ireland. And therefore, first, I will say a few words about Irish developments, although looking around, there are many people here who know a lot more about that than me. Um, I will then talk about the role of the EFSF, the institution that I'm managing the role of the EFSF in crisis management, and the creation of the new permanent crisis mechanism, the ESM. But the main part of my presentation, as you already hinted at, is indeed um, I want to talk about the wide range of measures that have been adopted during the last few months or which are under consideration right now and will be adopted the next few months. Um, which relate to a strengthening of the Stability and Growth Pact, creating a better system of macroeconomic surveillance, um, stronger financial market supervision. And all these crisis prevention measures are important to prevent the next crisis. But they will also be important at the same time to improve the functioning of monetary union. And that's why they are particularly important um, when you look at the euro today, look at the problems that we face, um, look at crisis management on the one hand, but also crisis prevention on the other. I have these slides, and I hope that all of you can see them. And oh, okay. So first, as I said, a few words on Ireland. Um, nothing very new for you. Um, as you know, in the 90s, Ireland was transformed from one of the poorest countries in the EU to the wealthiest. Um, GDP growth averaged 6% during the period from 1995 to 2007. This was the best performance in the EU that you could find. So all that looked wonderful. We talked about the Celtic Tiger. Um, but then during the crisis at the same, yeah, it all turned very, very negative. You know the numbers um, with um, three negative growth years, 2008, 2009, and 2010. So a cumulative loss and output of, of about 15%. Can you all see the slides? Or? Okay. You are aware of the reports that have been written, um, two last year by Governor Honohan, by Max Watson, myself, and more recently by Peter Nyberg. And they all talk about a combination of, of issues that came together, happened at the same time, that made the crisis so bad. It was a combination of homemade problems and global factors. Um, on this slide, they are summarized in a very brief way. Of course, one can discuss it endlessly, but I think it mentions um, the main points. You saw last decade strong, um, a strong domestic financial boom. There was unprecedented access to funding from financial markets, um, not only in Ireland, but also from other Euro area countries. Because um, the time Ireland entered the Euro and when monetary union began was also the moment when financial market <laughs> integration in the EU became much more intense. You know the UK banks that entered the market. Um, that put ad additional pressure on interest rates. Interest rates, of course, had already come down in the context of AMU accession. Um, there is a strong preference in Irish society for property, which particularly for German is a bit surprising, but I, we discussed it last year. Um, it's a strong cultural difference. Um, then there was a lack of budgetary discipline despite the fact that there was a budget surplus for many, many years. We know that budgetary policy did become pro-cyclical 
in the middle of the last decade. This was not criticized heavily, um, really by, by outside bodies who were in charge of doing this, of supervising the economy, the IMF, OECD, the European Union, including me, myself, and my job as Director General of DG Ecfin, we all failed. There was some debate on credit bubbles, um, housing boom, but it was not strong enough, this criticism. So when you mentioned um, that nobody was in charge, it indeed applies um, to many institutions um, and persons. And there was weak governance in the country, um, weak risk management in the banks, there was an over-dependence on wholesale funding, clearly insufficient bank supervision. Um, you will find much more on all this in the three reports, but I think it was the important message is that it was a combination of these factors. One cannot say that two or three um, issues came together or one or two institutions failed or that all the bankers were too greedy all that would not be sufficient. One has to look at everything together, what happened in Ireland and what happened in the global economy. Well, when the crisis intensified, um, here on this slide you see the CDS spreads. The Irish government had to make a request for financial assistance in November last year. The euro area several other EU member states and the IMF came together to provide assistance in the context of a country program, of an adjustment program that you are all familiar with. The financial assistance program has an amount of 85 billion euro. 17.5 of that comes from Ireland itself. 67.5 comes from, from the European partners and the IMF. The objectives of the program clearly address the main problems of the Irish economy at the moment. First, to strengthen and restructure the banking sector. Second, um, to have ambitious fiscal adjustment because Ireland has the highest fiscal deficit in the EU so that fiscal sustainability can be restored. And thirdly, to implement structural reforms so that growth can start again, that potential growth is protected or increased. Um, these are the three um, clear objectives of the program. As I mentioned, the total amount is 85 billion euro, 17.5 um, coming from the Irish, um, from Ireland itself. The remaining 67.5 billion euro are split, one third is coming from the IMF, one third from the so-called EFSM, I will explain the EFSM in a moment, and the remaining third comes from the EFSF and also from bilateral loans from the UK, Denmark and Sweden, who are participating in this operation on a voluntary basis. There's no legal obligation for non-Euro area countries to co-finance the EFSF. So it was their voluntary decision to do this. Disbursement takes place over three years and the average maturity of the loan is seven and a half years. So one of the contributors to this program is the EFSF, the institution that I manage, and the other one is the EFSM. And together, these institutions um, comprise the 750 billion financial stability package that was launched by EU leaders in May last year. The 750 billion package has three elements. The smallest one is 60 billion managed by the European Commission called European Financial Stabilization Mechanism, EFSM. So this is supported by all 27 EU member states. And it's 60 billion, you may ask why it's such a small amount. This was just available under the EU budget as guarantee. Um, more would have required um, reshuffling the EU budget, which is a very complicated undertaking. So the 60 billion was, was available. 440 billion, um, that's the number, the amount in guarantees 
that support the work of the EFSF. And then the IMF made a political commitment to add 50% to whatever the European countries um, come up with. A few words on the EFSF, because that's the biggest part of this, and it's my institution, so to say. Our mandate is clear to safeguard financial stability in Europe. We do that by raising funds in capital markets to finance loans to Euro area member states that need financial assistance. It's based on guarantees from member states, 440 billion. Um, the EFSF is an emergency lending facility, so we only lend money in an emergency when the euro is at risk and in the context of an adjustment program that means with strict conditionality. Conditionality means um, economic policy adjustments to improve the fundamentals of the economy to regain sustainability. So the EFSF was politically created in May, then legally um, founded in June last year. We are based in Luxembourg. Shareholders are all Euro area member states. We have been operational since August. The EFSF is a temporary institution. We will only operate till the middle of 2013. After that, we will still continue, but only manage outstanding loans and outstanding bonds. Ireland was the first case in which we became active. Um, as you know, negotiations are going on in Lisbon right now, so Portugal very well might be the second case. The EFSF is a very small institution. Um, we have a staff of only 12 person. This is possible because um, I rely on the help of two other well-known big institutions. The European Investment Bank does a lot of the um, back office work, and the European Investment Bank is a neighbor in Luxembourg. And the German debt office, the Deutsche Finanzagentur, um, does a lot of the front office work. That means they do actually the debt issuance under supervision from the EFSF, of course, and on account um, of the EFSF, but they carry out the actual work. The European Central Bank is a paying agent, and the board of directors um, that supervises the work of the EFSF comprises the deputy finance ministers of the 17 euro area countries. As I mentioned, the first operation, the first financial operation of the EFSF was a bond issue in January this year, where we raised 5 billion euro. This was a big success because it was nine times oversubscribed, which is a very large um, number. Um, this shows that the international investors do have confidence in the euro, um, in the strategy that was adopted last year. Otherwise, they would not have put 45 billion euro on the table to bid for the 5 billion available. So the fear that was widespread in markets um, six months ago, particularly in New York, that the euro might disappear the next three or four years, this has disappeared. Otherwise, global investors would not have tried to buy these bonds um, to such a large extent. The EFSM, which is a small 60 billion pot, that's also part of the overall rescue operation, um, the EFSM also did an issue in January, in early January, for 5 billion in support of Ireland, and they had a second issue um, three weeks ago, um, amounting to 3.4 billion. We ourselves will also go back to the market um, later this year. And the intention is that this year, overall, the EFSF will issue around 16 billion in the markets. Um, and then next year, up to 10 billion, while the EFSM is doing um, around 17 billion this year and, six and 5 billion next year. The precise numbers may vary depending on market situation and also the Irish need, because there are reviews of the Irish adjustment program before every disbursement, and we always discuss with the authorities, of course, um, when the money is needed and how much is needed. 
and this can well change over time as economic conditions change. So much about the financial rescue operations and intentions, but of course a lot more is happening in the euro area than just money. Financial assistance, facilities, uh, mechanisms are important during a crisis, but they can only help to buy time. In the end, countries have to make the adjustment, but it is very important to buy time so that countries have sufficient time to do the adjustment, which can be painful and takes time um, to show positive effects. So what are the other things that are, we are doing in Europe? Um, there's really a range of measures, a long list of issues that have been tackled and that are being tackled um, these um, days. And you can group them into the first three categories, categories here. Um, we are in the process of strengthening economic governance. We have already established a new financial market architecture that's in place. Um, we are in the process of setting up a permanent crisis resolution mechanism. I mentioned also a fourth point, which unfortunately is not really tackled. It's not much discussed by the political leaders. Um, we should speak more with one voice in the outside world. I will also come back to that. But on the first three issues, a lot is happening. On strengthening economic governance, um, decision has been taken already to introduce a so-called European semester. I come back to that in a moment. The reform of the Stability and Growth Pact, um, there we have seen some decisions. The final decision now is being discussed with the European Parliament, which after the Lisbon Treaty was, um, became effective, is involved in these decisions. Um, so we are now in the so-called trilogue between the Council, the European Commission, and the European Parliament, and decisions are expected to be taken by June. Third point, the surveillance of um, economic policies. Here, a new excessive imbalance procedure is being created and we have decisions on the Euro Plus Pact. Let me say a few words on each of these points. On the European semester. European semester means that fiscal policy, which remains in the responsibility of national governments, um, will take more into account the views of partner countries. Um, what happened in the past is that normally um, the national budget process unfolded in each and every country of the Union, and then late in the game there was a discussion in Brussels among finance ministers about the different budgetary intentions. <laughs> that has been turned around, um, and from this year on, and this is relevant for the budget 2012 then, the budgetary intentions are um, sent to the Commission in Brussels, to the European Commission. The Commission analyzes these intentions, um, provides the paper and the analysis to all the other member states on each of the um, 27 EU members. Then there's a discussion in Brussels among the finance ministers. And in light of that discussion and the views of partner countries, the final decision on next year's budget is taken in every member state knowing what were the comments from the partner countries. And I think that's a significant pro progress because um, budgets do have implications for the country in which the budget is adopted, but obviously there are many spillover effects, particularly from the big countries, but basically from all countries. Economic policies in the monetary union, um, national economic policies, including budgetary policies, do have implications for the neighbors and um, parliaments and governments that adopt these economic policies should be aware of these spillovers. And therefore, this new process on the budget, the European semester, is a good way to make um, those who take the final decision on the national budget aware of what the other countries in the Union think. So I think this is substantial progress that would not have been possible without the crisis because the European Commission proposed such a European semester already in 2005 and the member states said, no, no, we don't want this. 
too much interference in our national affairs, too much transfer of sovereignty, and it was not supported by a majority in the Council. Now, after the crisis, it was easy to adopt this proposal, and I think it will um, be one important element when we try to reform monetary union in a way that it can function better in the future. The next point is the Stability and Growth Pact, where the rules will be strengthened and countries have made commitments to apply these rules better than the past. As you probably know, the Stability and Growth Pact has been um, an important element of monetary union since the beginning. It was not always implemented fully um, by all countries. This must change. Um, but the Stability and Growth Pact had some positive effects. Sometimes you read in the newspapers that it didn't work at all. And that would be the wrong um, assessment. One way to look at it is um, to look at the year 2007, the last year before the crisis really hit. In the year 2007, the fiscal deficit of the euro area as a whole was 0.6% of GDP. If the pact had worked perfectly, it should have been a small surplus because this was at the end of a cycle um, after a few years of reasonable growth. So it was, did not work perfectly. But 0.6 deficit was the smallest deficit in 25 years. And compared to deficits you find in other countries where the stability pact does not apply, like United States, United Kingdom, or Japan, they all had deficits between 2.5% and 3% of GDP. And this was, particularly in the UK and US, after five boom years with growth above potential. They also had their bubbles. And still they had a deficit of almost 3% of GDP. My conclusion is that in Europe we prevented excessively high deficits because we have this process of annual reports, monitoring by the Commission, um, permanent discussions in the Council, peer pressure. So it didn't work perfectly, but it showed some positive effects. We should build on that, improve the system, um, and we are trying to do that by strengthening the rules. There will be um, earlier sanctions if necessary. The process to get to sanctions will be um, accelerated. There will also be more focus on public debt. Of course, we will continue to focus also on, on the fiscal deficits, the annual deficits, but also the debt levels will, be, um, will become more important. The preventive dimension of the exercise will become um, more important. The preventive area is when a country has a fiscal deficit that does not exceed the 3% limit, but the country is not yet in a balanced budgetary position. That is the preventive arm of the pact. And here we will also introduce in the future a stronger system of monitoring and even the possibility of sanctions. Then importantly, the voting mechanism is about to change. So far, like almost all the time um, when you look at how the EU operates, Proposals come from the Commission. The Council then has to adopt um, the proposal with the majority or reject it. And sometimes the European Parliament has to agree as well. For the Stability and Growth Pact in the future, um, most of the decisions will be taken by the so-called re reversed voting mechanism. That means a proposal from the Commission is adopted unless it is rejected by a qualified majority of member states. And that's a crucial difference to the old system where a qualified majority must support the Commission. So here, a qualified majority would be needed to reject um, a proposal from the Commission. We don't have the final um, details on all this because now, as I mentioned earlier, the European Parliament gets involved, rightly so, after the Lisbon Treaty. They strongly support Commission views um, and want to make the Stability Pact really much tougher. Member states on a few details are a bit more hesitant, but I hope that the um, European Parliament um, and the Commission together will be able to succeed and make the pact as strong as possible. The third element is the
Yeah, that's the right one. We will have a new system to survey national economic policies. Um, in the past, we always had the Stability and Growth Pact to look at fiscal developments. That's important. It will continue. It will become stronger. But there was not really a system, there was not a framework to analyze broader economic policy developments. Um, there were discussions, because finance ministers of the euro area meet every month. They do discuss, and they discussed in the past, um, of course, inflation developments, current account imbalances, um, diverging unit labor costs, and all of that. But there was not a framework in which one could deal with such deviations and um, divergences. So in the future, there will be a new framework called excessive imbalance procedure, where there's a regular monitoring of developments, um, analysis from the Commission, discussions in the Council, recommendations to a country, if necessary, a follow-up, um, and the possibility of sanctions if a country repeatedly does not follow the recommendations from the Council. So um, this will be a new framework that hopefully will prevent something that we saw during this crisis very clearly, that we have a number of countries in the euro area where the current account deficits became too large, competitiveness was lost because unit labor costs increased a lot more than in the other euro area countries. Um, credit booms happen in some countries with associated housing booms. You all know that very well. Um, so that, in the future, that's the intention to identify such problems earlier and then to put forward recommendations for policy changes to prevent these imbalances from becoming excessive. All this will be complemented by the so-called Euro Plus Pact that was adopted by the European Council, so the heads of state and government of the EU at the end of March. Here the focus is again on competitiveness. Um, it's also on promoting employment and sustainability. The positive thing about this Euro Plus Pact is that at the highest political level, additional commitments will be undertaken and they will be monitored by the European Council itself. Commitments will be made country by country because every country has some weaknesses, also Germany. Um, Germany will also make commitments what to change over the next 12 months, and every other country will make commitments. These commitments will be very different um, in different countries, obviously, depending on where the weaknesses in the economy are. And then it will be reviewed after a year um, and this should complement the other measures I mentioned to get to a situation where the euro area develops um, um, without excessive imbalances and with a stronger focus on sustainability and employment. Another important factor for the good functioning of monetary union is a stronger um, supervisory system. And here the decisions have been taken. They became effective in January of this year. We created um, a new European Systemic Risk Board that is in charge of monitoring macro financial um, risks. Macro prudential supervision is an area that was neglected before the crisis, not only in Europe, also in other countries. Also, the United States has now created a body that is in charge of looking at macroprudential problems. And this is important for monetary union even more than for the United States because in the supervisory area, we do have instruments available that can be used in a country-specific sense. Obviously, monetary policy cannot be used in a country-specific sense. It's one interest rate for every country in the euro area. But on the supervisory side, um, we do have such instruments, and to take Ireland as an example, um, if this European Systemic Risk Board had existed five years ago, I would expect that they would have told the supervisors in Ireland to do something about the housing bubble, the real estate bubble. Um, the instruments to do something were available, they were not used, and this is not an 
only a criticism of Ireland. It's, these instruments were also not used in the US, for instance, or in the United Kingdom. But the instruments were available. It would have been possible to tell the banks that they could not provide mortgages amounting to 110% of the purchasing price, but only 80%. It would have been possible to do that in Ireland, in the US, in the UK. It did not happen. But there was also nobody to tell the Irish authorities to do it. Um, with this new board, which has the mandate to look exactly at such problems, I would expect that there will be peer pressure um, to take action if needed in the future. So it will be an important um, institutional progress that we have this new body. And as I said, I think it's particularly important in a monetary union more than in a national context. Also in January this year, three new European supervisory authorities were created to supervise banking, insurance, and securities markets. There is some real transfer of sovereignty here from the national to the EU level. Of course, national supervisors will continue to operate. Um, it's like often in Europe, there are centralized institutions which are relatively small, and a lot of the work continues to be done at the national level. But this is the first time that um, centralized institutions on banking, insurance, and securities markets have some real authority, particular in a crisis. As you probably know, um, the European, European Banking Authority is right now organizing the next stress test for banks. And the expectation is that um, they will um, make sure that this next stress test is more credible than the last one that was undertaken last summer. So these are important developments for the future functioning of monetary union on the governance side, stability pact, on surveillance, on financial market supervision. The final point is that we are also creating a permanent crisis mechanism. Um, as I said earlier, financing can be important during a crisis to buy time. It does not substitute for the action at the national level. Um, but I think in Europe, it was necessary to create such an institution. We have the EFSF on a temporary basis. We will have the ESM on a permanent basis from 2013. This was not foreseen when monetary union was created. In the 90s, um, I worked in the German Ministry of Finance at the time. We did not think that this was needed. Um, today, I think it is a gap. It's good that we are closing this gap. Um, why do we need to do it? Um, one, one point is that unlike in a country, the euro area has no well-defined fiscal center that could act in times of crisis. In the United States, um, when there is a problem, if a big city, a county, a state has payments problems, um, has liquidity problems, it's very clear who in the end will step in. It doesn't have to be written down anywhere. It will be Washington. Everybody knows that. This happened in 1975 when New York City was close to a default. In the end, Washington put in money, um, but the budget of New York City was managed from Washington. That's the quid pro quo. In the US, as I said, it doesn't have to be defined. In the euro area, it needs to be defined because it's not clear who would do it. The EU budget is too small for it. The EU budget is just 1% of GDP. It's also too inflexible. It cannot run deficits. So it, that's one reason why a crisis mechanism is quite important to be created. Um, also, before the crisis, we had several mechanisms, balance of payments facilities for other countries, EU member states that are not members of the euro area. There's a balance of payments facility from which Hungary, Latvia, Romania, for instance, have benefited. This existed, had existed for a long time. There were also, and there are facilities for neighborhood countries that can receive balance of payments assistance with conditionality or the normal approach in the context of an adjustment program. But there was nothing for the Euro, Euro area as a whole. So that, that's another good reason why something needed to be done to fill this gap. This was also the 
conclusion after the Great Depression um, at a global scale where the International Monetary Fund was created because during the Depression um, it was also realized that such an institution that could provide um, financial assistance during a crisis was useful. As we are now working on the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, a few decisions have already been taken, but we are working now on the details to um, implement the policy decisions. The ESM will become a real international institution working under public law, unlike the EFSF, which is um, privately organized under Luxembourg law because that was the only way to get it going very quickly. The ESM will provide loans um, to member states, members of the euro area, with against strict conditionality in the context of a country program. So in that um, respect, there's no change um, with the current EFSF. The effective lending capacity is, will be 500 billion euro, and that will be reached through subscribed capital of 700 billion, of which 80 billion will be paid in. The main difference compared to the temporary arrangement that we have at the moment with the EFSF is that we will have a system for so-called private sector involvement. That means that during a crisis, um, everybody will know what are the circumstances under which private creditors will be asked to participate in the crisis resolution and, if necessary, in the burden sharing. It was decided that we will follow, in this respect, the established IMF policies, which have been developed over the last few decades and which are well known to the market. And the, the key point here is that in these established IMF policies, there's always um, an analysis made whether the solution of a crisis requires liquidity support or whether we are dealing with a solvency crisis. And if it's liquidity, then private creditors will not be asked to participate in any kind of burden sharing because obviously loans will be given and repaid. It's a temporary liquidity problem. If it's a solvency problem, and if debt reduction is required, then in that case, private creditors will be asked to participate and there will be no public support unless private creditors also make a contribution. That's a very clear um, distinction in principle. To implement it will always create problems because countries and banks, for that matter, can move from a liquidity problem to a solvency problem, and it may not always be so easy to identify precisely what kind of problem one deals with. But it's, I think, important to get the principles right that in a liquidity crisis, um, there's no burden sharing required. It would also not be appropriate to interfere with property rights to break contracts um, if it's just a liquidity crisis. But if it's a solvency crisis, then burden sharing will be required. We hope that all these things will be in place um, by 2013 when the work of the EFSF ends and the ESM should um, take up its operations. My final point very quickly because it's not much discussed, but I think it also um, is an element that would help to make AMU function better, is the external representation. We don't organize that very well so far in the monetary union. Um, we are represented with too many voices in the international bodies like IMF and the international fora like G20 that could be streamlined. Um, I think we would gain influence in the world if we did that on the European side. Um, that's why I mentioned it and I hope to see progress one day. At the moment, I don't see much progress. But otherwise, in the other areas, um, as I tried to make clear, I think we do see substantial progress. I also want to say that, in my view, the euro continues to be a success story. Despite all the crisis um, talk and all the problems we find in a number of countries, one should not forget that the euro has delivered low inflation. Um, it has protected the single market of the EU. 
against exchange rate volatility, volatility which we saw a lot until the mid-90s, until we saw the run-up to monetary union. The euro has clearly become the second most important reserve currency in the world. When I travel around the world talking to investors to convince them to buy EFSF bonds, um, I hear again and again, particularly in Asia, do everything to protect the euro. We don't want to live in a world economy that's dominated by only one currency. The euro is respected. Um, the rest of the world wants it to be there and to be stable. These are all um, pluses that we should not forget as we deal with the crisis. Success, but we also identified um, already years ago where the weaknesses are in the design of the monetary union. These weaknesses became then much, much clearer during the crisis. We knew already, and the Commission wrote about this um, in 2000. Um, six in 2007 that we needed to improve economic governance, strengthen the stability pact, have better macroeconomic surveillance, um, that we needed to improve financial market supervision. All these items were well identified, but with the crisis it's, it became much clearer that we had to act. I tried to explain that we are acting. There is progress on governance, on the stability pact, on surveillance, on financial market supervision, on the creation of a crisis mechanism. All this will be important, and I'm convinced that all this will contribute to make monetary union work better in the future. Um, it's always um, symptomatic, I think, when you're in the middle of a crisis that you don't see the way out. It's hard to say when will the crisis end, will we ever get out of this, this is the nature of a crisis. But I'm convinced that in five years or so, when we look back, we will realize that the reforms, which to some extent became only possible because of the crisis, um, that we can really say that we have used this crisis to take measures to adopt reforms that will lead us to more Europe, to deeper integration, and therefore to a better functioning monetary union. Thank you very much.